Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Bogdan, and I work at the Center for Urban History, uh, mainly on the public history projects. And uh, I will say a few words about uh, the project in general. Uh, this is an initiative which was uh, envisaged and uh, is uh, uh, introduced and uh, soon will be the end of this initiative together with the University of St. Gallen from Switzerland and the series of lectures uh, plus the final seminar and plus a small publication uh, has the title to mountains from a city imagining Carpathians in arts and culture. And uh, we already had uh, two lectures. Uh, the whole program was uh, initiated by, by uh, Dr. Patrice Dombrowski. Uh, and uh, we talked about discovering the Carpathians. Uh, uh, and then this, it was followed by the lecture of Dr. Vladislav Mstelet, uh, who uh, highlighted the issue of uh, Jewish, Ukrainian, and Polish uh, uh, relations in the neighboring mountains uh, regions. And uh, uh, today's lecture is titled Rural Practice, Commercial Enterprise, or Imperial Service, Julius Dudkevich's Carpathian Ethnographic and Landscape Photography. And this uh, lecture, as it's uh, entitled, is about Julius Dudkevich uh, from Kolomea. So we come closer to uh, the other side of Carpathian. So we are talking about Tatras, we are talking about like Pambirschina and then Boyko region, and now we are closer to famous town of Kolomea and its photographer, uh, or mainly Julius Dudkevich as one of the most famous photographers. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased and honored to introduce Ksenia Kibuzinski, uh, who received her PhD in literary studies. Uh, she is currently uh, uh, serves as a head of the Petrojacek Central and East European Resource Center, and also Slavic Resource Coordinator for the University of Toronto Library. She is a co-director of the Petrojacek program for the study of Ukraine and also coordinated for the Ukrainian research group at the Central, uh, sorry, at the Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies, Moon School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. I had the pleasure to meet Ksenia at the uh, international conference where I uh, uh, listened to the lecture about uh, uh, this famous photographer and uh, I liked it very much. And uh, I also uh, close friend of the uh, Kirillo Horishny, who will uh, at the end produce with Ksenia a book uh, or the album on this. But uh, for now, I, I hope I said everything. Uh, just a short remark uh, is uh, uh, Zoom translation is broadcasted via YouTube channel of the Center for Urban History. And all those who are not in this chat room here in Zoom, uh, they can also ask questions from YouTube. Uh, and uh, if we will have questions from YouTube, we will uh, post them here in the chat and Mariana will help us uh, to, to have this. Okay, Senu, the floor is yours. And I will introduce uh, commentators later. Um, well, uh, before I begin my slideshow, I just I would like to thank uh, our organizers, Bohdan Shumilovich and Mariana Mazurak, and our very distinguished discussants, uh, Patrice Dabrowski. Uh, who I really encourage, if you did not get a chance to hear her keynote speech, um, to to listen to it on YouTube. And, and uh, Herbert Usnick from Vienna, who I had the pleasure to meet several years ago when I was beginning my research. Um, I'm also grateful for the translation. Um, it helps to um, reach um, the important audience of, of people in Ukraine um, and all of you who are participating today. Um, uh, and before I begin the formal part of my presentation, I would like to share with you how I came about researching Yulius Stutkevich, um, and also to acknowledge my limitations. 
I'm not a historian of photography. I'm not a historian of the Carpathians or Austria, Galicia or Western Ukraine. Um, like some of you, I'm an armchair traveler to the Carpathian mountains and I've only recently had the good fortune to drive through them twice. Um, uh, and I would love to spend more time there. I am though a cultural historian and a practicing librarian uh, with a deep interest in provenance research. So I'm really interested in how material circulates by following traces that are found in print objects. So book stamps, ex libri, autographs, dedications, uh, et cetera. And my other interest is in pre-World War II biographical, biographical research of disappeared figures of cultural and historical significance and surfacing primary sources to clarify or correct misunderstandings. Um, so that's where the my librarians had, uh, I have the advantage of really having those research skills. Um, there are many individuals like Dutkevich who have disappeared. Um, from our histories, uh, either through the dearth of documentation caused by wars, occupation, and transfers of populations, or because of our own very narrow understandings of who belongs in which national history. So it's good to see that history has moved away from, from being nationally specific. So let me go ahead and share my screen now and launch my... PowerPoint. Um, I'll just go to the beginning here. So um, what I'm going to share with you today is a micro level history of one individual and his career. Um, there are aspects of Dutkevich's photography that merit in-depth analysis. Images are multifaceted sources for inquiry from what they do or do not depict. Um, either, you know, there's choice of subject matter, cropping, uh, their creation, so who took the photograph, the technical skills required to produce it, the productive and distribu distributive aspects, um, the enterprise behind photographs, such as studios, exhibitions, and sales, as well as photographs, manipulation, and reproduction. So my objectives are simply to acquaint you with Yulia Stutkevich's background and photographic career and to offer some historical context. So my discovery of Yulia Stutkevich dates to 2014 when my friend and colleague Kirill Horishny, who was mentioned earlier, who is an historian, publisher, and photographer in Lviv, contacted me with a simple question. Did I know anything about a photo book held up by my university here in Toronto entitled Album Pukutsia by Yulius Stutkevich and whether it contained images of Galicia's petroleum and forestry industry? When I went over next door to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, I found out that the album's contents, which is about 120 images on 67 pages, included a number of images associated with the Columia Ethnographic Exhibition Committee, um, as well as portraits, ethnographic portraits of various time, types. So when I flipped through the album, I had no idea it would lead me down a rabbit hole. A pursuit that began as an answer to a reference question turned into a recovery of the history of Yura Drahiruk Band of Brigands, or Oprishke, um, it led to the resurfacing of forgotten photo albums in national libraries, for example, in Romania, uh, the correction of mistaken attributions and works towards a, a book manuscript that is still ongoing. So who was Julius Stutkevich? Uh, there was almost no information when I began this research, um, but I can now state uh, he was a pioneer, uh, a pioneering ethnographic and mountaineering photographer of the greater Pukutian region in general and of the Hutsul region in particular. And it's important to note how early he was working. Um, he grew up in the 1830s and 40s at a time when 
Louis-Jacques Mandé de Guerre and William Henry Fox Talbot were developing their first photographic technologies, respectively, in and England. Aspiring daguerreotypists quickly adopted those technical processes and began to set up studios throughout Europe and the United States within the first decade after the medium's discovery. The introduction of speedier, duplicable wet collodion process in 1851, which would kind of coincide with Julius Tutkevich's era, which was also then followed by more portable factory produced gelatin plates in 1878, enabled photographers to open commercial establishments in even the most parts of the world, so including Kolomia. So Dudkevich belongs to this second generation. Documenting his practice or of those of other photographers in Austria Galicia is generally challenging, which holds true for many of the region's other professional classes, be it lawyers, notaries, merchants, and physicians who receive less attention by historians as compared to clergy, teachers, and political leaders who led national movements. His Dudkevich's life trajectory has proven especially difficult to situate and verify. Until very recently, many of his photographs were attributed to someone with a, the same surname, Miletius Dudkevich, or not attributed at all. The photographic albums he compiled that are held by major cultural, national, and academic institutions, such as the one at University of Toronto, offered minimal descriptions. Uh, the focus has generally been on the subject matter or the geography of the images and not so much on the creators or the source of acquisition, so the provenance. Um, there's also the iconicity of Dudkevich's photographs, because the more you learn and discover his images, the more you see them everywhere. Uh, and, um, and as well as the kind of constant reproduction, imitation, rearrangement, and excision over more than a century of time. And we find ourselves left with artistic simulacra of the original meeting between the photographer and his subject and client. And I have some examples here for you of a, an, exib uh, a, an exhibit that was advertised in Vive in 2017 for Graphic Arts, which is a, um, a drawing that's uh, based on a photograph by Dudkevich that we see to the left. Um, then there's, there was the postcards that were kind of distributed in the 1890s, 1900s. They were very cheap ways to, to access photography. Um, and you'll see in this one image uh, for a postcard from Lviv floating over the letter O is a pair. Um, and these are actually uh, based on a, a photograph by Dudkevich. Um, of Ruthenian peasants from Kozmach. Uh, so there they are floating over Lviv. Um, this is a very interesting one. Um, so the photograph on the left, Jews of Galicia is the title. Um, and you'll see that just one figure has been extracted and placed on what is today Vulitsa Knyaja Romana in Lviv. Um, that was produced uh, by the postcard publisher Letterer and Popper, or this one uh, by the same publisher of a Jew and Hutzels from Zabia, today Verkhovena, on their way to market. But now just the Jew astride the horse is um, out, depicted outside the city slaughterhouse in view, and the Hutzels have been replaced by these two young children. So um, uh, now in terms of uh, the biographical details that reveal Dudkevich's identity, um, we, we can um, look to the backs of the images um, to, to kind of, and, and as well as articles from newspapers of the time, memoirs, ethnographic histories and exhibition catalogs to, to try to recreate his biography. And, and part of that involves 
um, looking at the changes in language on the versos of the photographs as it moves from German to Polish. So you can then kind of see, use 1867 as a marker um, of when some of the photographs might be dated and, and help you locate where he was working. Um, uh, but again, it, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge or um, as he was awarded various um, uh, kind of uh, distinguishing um, prizes from various um, kings and emperors um, and, and um, other types of awards um, as they're added to the back of the image. Um, and if you know the date when that award was given, that helps narrow down also uh, some of his biographical uh, details. So the, what I can tell you about Dutkevich is one multifaceted way to characterize him, and this is my interpretation, is a Polonized Ruthenian German with Russophile sympathies. Yet here I think the attribute of Galician seems more appropriate. He was born in Pest in 1834. His father was Ruthenian. Um, he worked as a canonist in the Austrian army and was a bookbinder, which I think influenced his son's career path. Dutkevich's mother was German-Hungarian, his stepmother Galician-German. Uh, Julius Dutkevich married twice and baptized all his children in the Roman Catholic Church. His first wife was German, his second one was definitely Ukrainian, the daughter of a Ukrainian teacher. He maintained close personal ties with Russophile priests such as Yakiv Holovatsky and Ivan Naumovich. Uh, we know he was conversant in German, Polish, and Ruthenian. Um, furthermore, he accommodated a clientele that ranged from Austrian bureaucrats to Polish nobles and from Jewish merchants to Ruthenian intellectuals or Hutzel mountaineers. It's his familial and cultural background suggests that he was able easily to shift from one class or national group to the other, depending on the circumstances in his role as photographer, which one in which he honed his skills as a documenter of Hutzel Galician and Bukovinian folk in a changing land um, as it was changing technologically from petroleum discovery to the increase in railways. He grew up and matured in an era of ethnic heterogeneity and socio-political complexity unseen elsewhere in the Habsburg monarchy. Furthermore, he was raised within a familial milieu with ties to the Austrian military and upper civil servant class, as well as Greek Catholic clergy. And this environment instilled in his generation of the family strong interests in natural sciences and technology. Uh, three of his cousins were also accomplished professional photographers, with the one confused with Julius Maletius Tutkevich, uh, the, the portrait of the man in this slide, building a name for himself as a portraitist and copyist of artworks in post-1867 Congress Poland. And he was also a horticulturalist, raising rare cacti and orchids in his greenhouse. Um, his uh, two sons uh, were also photographers. Uh, Karol uh, Dutkevich, Maletsius's son, actually was an early photographer of the Tatra Mountains. And the younger son, uh, Peter Dutkevich, was an ethnographic photographer uh, in Africa. Uh, so, so there's something to be said in, in the family. And I've also discovered a Boleslas Dutkevich working in Paris as a photographer, but I've yet to make the connection. So aside from these photographers, there were also um, family members who taught natural sciences at a gymnasium in Berejana and an uncle who was a famed beekeeper. So, uh, and then Julius Stutkevich and his first partnership was with Ju Julian Wang, a successful engineer, chemist, industrialist, and entrepreneur in Stanislav or what is now Ivano Frankivsk in the 1870s, who built the, the city's first gas works. Dutkevich's nascent photographic skills and connections to Russophile 
clerics and the Polish ruling class led to his earliest commissions in support of science when he participated in several ethnographic exhibitions. And it's within these venues that brought him local, national and international recognition, both for his subject matter and his technical proficiency. Um, his participation was solicited from various groups, ranging from pan Slavis intent on bu building closer ties to St. Petersburg, or to the Kolomia branch of the Tatra Society focused on spring tourism and Eastern best kids. Um, these are locations of his studios. Uh, he moved from Suchava to Lviv to Ivano Frankivsk and then ended his career in Kolomia. So all of these are easily connected by the, the advances in the railway. He has, Professional practice developed in the easternmost part of the Austrian Empire during the second half of the 19th century when he stamped his name on the back of formal portraits of wealthy boyar families uh, in the 1850s in the small town of Suchava, located in the historical region of Bukovina. Um, from there, his career advanced and he moved his portraitist business to Lviv around 1865. Uh, where he worked on his own, as well as in partnership with Julian Wang in a studio that was located in a very prestigious area of Lviv between the hotels European and George. Um, in Lviv, he prepared traditional carte de visite and applied images onto porcelain, enamel, and glass. Um, and it was during this phase he was mostly limited to portraiture. Um, and these are examples of some of his portraits. His clientele included prominent citizens of and visitors to Lviv. Um, they included veterans of the 1863-64 uprising against Russian rule in the Kingdom of Poland, who counted in their ranks young Polish conscripts, high-ranking officers and members of the political class. One veteran who walked into his studio was 50-year-old Jan Zech, the chemist who pioneered techniques to distill and purify oil and introduced kerosene lamps to Lviv in Vienna. Um, and there are other images of high society. Um, in Kolomia, we have the fortune he photographed Mikhailo Bilous, the editor and publisher there, um, as well as um, lovely ladies of uh, high ranking, uh, daughters of high ranking um, uh, civil servants and clergy. Um, he was also uh, you know, uh, an opportunist um, and he would occasionally capture newsworthy events with his camera. Um, and he, uh, after the devastating fire in Buchach in 1865, took this photograph um, of the church there um, that included uh, uh, sculptures by Pinzel um, that so, and, and you have to, wonder how he got that vantage point to take that particular image or um, after the great fire of in Stanislavia in 1868 uh, or Ivano Frankivsk and I've yet to see original prints this is an image pulled from the internet and as well as an advertisement um, announcing that you can buy these two views of after the fire so for historians um, these are really important images that um, are worthy of study for urban history, such as the center that's sponsoring today's event. Um, it was in the 1860s um, when he was still working between Suchava and Lviv that a member of the Ruthenian triad took notice of Dutkevich's work. Um, Yakiv Hlovatsky, historian, ethnographer, and writer, selected several of Dutkevich's photographs to include in Russia's first major ethnographic exhibition that was held in Moscow in 1867 under the leadership of His Imperial Highness the Grand Duke Vladimir Alexandrovich. Uh, the exhibition was organized by the Society of Friends of Natural Science at Moscow University. The original focus of the exhibit was on non-Russian peoples of the empire but they soon decided to include a specifically Russian, great white and little Russian section to show the dominance of the ruling nation over its minorities. But then the exhibit 
expanded even further to include West and South Slavs following a proposal by the historian and Slavist Neil Alexandrovich Popov, who reasoned that the inclusion of these latter groups would provide a comparative perspective for understanding Russians. So in addition to Poles, Bulgarians, and Serbians who lived within the empire, the organizing committee soon added exhibits of Slavic peoples living in Austria and Ottoman empires. And, and the Slavic section soon was second only to the Russian one in importance. And Holovatsky was the chief organizer for the Galician part of the exhibit um, through the auspices of the Galician Ruthenian Society and the Ruthenian People's Home and View. So he collected material from Galicia, Bukovina, and Carpathians, which aside from examples of material culture included a, a number of photographs. Um, and here they generally, historians attribute all the photographs to Yulia Stutkevich, but that was not the case. Um, it was um, many photographs were from by, taken by the Greek Catholic priest and photographer, Ilyarion Nizhankivsky, as well as uh, the priests Ivan Rakovsky and Anatoly Kralitsky. Um, and Dutkevich's own contribution was much more minor. And, and this is another area I think historians, um, it would be interesting on the clerical class and, and their use of photography um, is, is an, an under-researched area. So these photographers focused their document uh, efforts to document the ethnic groups of Hutzels, Boykos, and Lemkos. Um, and at that time, that was not so easy as peasants viewed technology skeptically um, uh, and were disinclined to be photographed. Um, since there was a feeling that if a camera recorded your likeness, that the image just as written records could serve as surrogates and that the authorities could assign, reassign their nationality or use them for other nefarious purposes. Um, so Nizhan Kivsky uh, led the efforts on gathering portraits uh, from the districts of Sambirstri and Horodok. Um, and of those that Holovatsky sent to Moscow, about 48 or 49 went on display. Um, how many of those were by Yulia Stutkevich is difficult to assess, but we know that Holovatsky based his illustrations and his work on Narodni Pisni, Galitsky, Ugorsky, Ruse on the actual photographs. So on the illustration on the right, we can. Um, see that from what we know of what exists of Yulia Stutkevich is a rearrangement of, of the um, uh, individuals uh, of the Hutzels from Mikuluchin with uh, and the one with the shepherd's pipe has been reversed. Um, this collection of photographs is nearly impossible to access in St. Petersburg despite um, many efforts on my part and, and of my friends and colleagues who live in Russia. Um, it, and I know that the, a historian in Poland, Eva Manikowska did get to see them, but for very limited time, I, uh, I think less than an hour. So um, it's uh, still for some reason, uh, highly guarded secret. So it's, this is another area that requires more investigation. So the overall exhibit in Moscow also included dioramas, mannequins uh, of these 60 ethnic groups. And these ranged from the Aluts of Alaska to the Mazurs of central Poland. Uh, and they were on display, as I mentioned earlier, ethnographic objects, the photographs and physical specimens, all representing the material culture and physical features of the peoples of the Russian empire and the West and South Slavs. The exhibition received a lot of coverage in the press um, as, uh, and as well as uh, the visit of a delegation of Slavic scholars and activists from Eastern U Europe who were there to attend the Pan-Slavic Congress. The timing of the exhibition and Congress coincided with the establishment of the dual monarchy, which added to a political a dimension to these two events. Um, and the Austrian German press concluded that the inclusion of Austrian Slavs in the displays and gatherings was a provocation, an anti-Austrian demonstration, meant to stir Muscovite annexation in the name of Slavic idea. 
So Julius Stutkevich, we can't quite know what his agenda was in this case. Um, he was still a, a young photographer kind of getting his grounding. Um, and, and we know from later uh, participation in, in exhibits throughout Austria Galicia, as well as this um, sharing of photo albums with the kings of Serbia and Romania and uh, two albums to Franz Josef, uh, that he played many, many angles in his business enterprise. Um, but his reputation continued to build uh, while he was in Ivano-Frankivsk in the 1870s, uh, but it particularly took off when he arrived in Kolomia in 1878, where he integrated himself into the city's life um, and uh, perfected his trade in the genres of type and landscape photography. Um, and this was a time when the locals and scholars and uh, tourists were eager to describe and promote the Carpathian Mountains and the Bukovinian and Galician landscapes, as well as the region's diverse communities. So the profitable commissions that came uh, after his move to Kolomia spurred Dudkevich to climb the highest peaks of the eastern Carpathian Mountains and to descend into the lowland villages of the Prut, Cheremosh, Nister, and Zbruch river valleys. He scaled 1800 meters to take the, what I believe must be the earliest known photograph of the rocky outcrops of Spitzi Mountain, depicted here on the left, and hiked down into a Carpathian gully to capture the flow of the Hramotni stream. Uh, uh, and then there are the images in between uh, of the towns of the Carpathians, such as this view of Kute. Now, this was not an easy feat. It involved carrying um, kilos worth of equipment. So I can only imagine how that might have been done with um, perhaps a team of, of horses and, and people to help carry the equipment. Of his exploits, one Lviv newspaper described him as a tireless gleaner of lookouts throughout eastern Galicia and Bukovina of types and of typical folk buildings and ancient monuments who penetrates the top of mountains and deep ravines and woods and who has left not a corner of this region worth photographing untouched. He um, took regional photographs of the Hutzel region, which was a world associated with the everyday as well as with industry. We see images that depict activities connected with agriculture, uh, economic, religious, and village life. There are scenes with market days and hunting lodges, the timber and petroleum industries, churches and monasteries, and ones with villagers at work and play, whether stacking hay, spinning wool, or at dance. Uh, so these are images of the salt mines in Sloboda Rungurska, where oil was discovered, and um, the oil fields that um, were then producing crude oil in the 1880s uh, to, to quite extent, and it was one of the most productive fields in Galicia. Um, there is also images of log driving near the Berkut and at the crossing of the Preluchni stream and the Chorni Cheremosh river, sawmills, um, images of peasants going about work or play. The photographs of the greater Hutzel region range geographically from Berejana in the north to Vatra Dorne, Romania in the south near the junction of the Zhvan um, in the south and from the summit of Pip Ivan in the west to the castle ruins of the village Zhvanets near the junction of the Zhvanchik and the Dniester rivers in Kaminets Pudiski Rayon to the east. And I've pinned um, where the images are located uh, onto a map. And so you can see how they generally cluster along the Carpathians. He photographed extensively the Chodnohara mountain range in the Eastern Beskids, the highest peaks, the pastures, valleys, cliffs, waterfalls, alpine lodges, etc. And he had very little competition. Uh, later photographs came 
such as Shuhevich and uh, Senkovsky, but uh, up until the 1890s, he pretty much had this area to himself. Conversely, um, we know that the Polish Tatras, the westerly section of the Carpathians and its highland villages, Zakopane, which Patrice Dobrowski has discussed in, in her, and as well in her talk in the book that she has just published was very much better documented during the 1860s to 1880s. And here I list photographers who were well known and a number of books that have been coming out uh, documenting this photographic exploration. Um, so aside from Columbia's advantage, advantageous location um, as a tourist destination and its proximity to mountains and river valleys. It was also a commercial opportunity for Dutkevich um, uh, in terms of taking portraits of ethnographic types. Um, he did continue to take traditional head and shoulder photographs of the kind of urban elites, their wives and children, but um, he also expanded his business into ethnography. Um, and he, this is where he probably is most recognized and most known. Um, and it was a time when ethnography went hand in hand with photography. So the scientific cataloging and studying of races, ethnic groups and types, and the new technology came to attention around 1840. So photographs, photographers such as Dudkevitz supplemented the income from their portrait studios with commissions from local and national ethnographic and tourist societies, which then in turn provided publishers of postcards, newspapers, and illustrated magazines increased revenue. Um, for nearly three decades, Dudkevitz photographed the various types, uh, so not only Hutzels, but also Armenians, Jews, Poles, and Roma, and the diversity of his subjects reflected the diversity of the population of Kolomia, the district in general, and the neighboring villages. An 18th century visitor had described the town on the banks of the Prut River as one of the most diverse in all of Galicia, where one could encounter merchants from all over, day after day, year after year, including Vlachs, Hungarians, Poles, Greeks, Russians, Armenians, Jews, Roma, Turk, and Lithuanians. And so here are just uh, several examples of the types, ethnographic types, Hutzel girls from Zabia in Verhovena with spinning uh, tools, a Jew with prayer elements from Unij, a Rome from Kosiv with his pipe, and Ar an Armenian from Kute astride his horse. Uh, Dudkevich photographed these people either in his studio or at local inns against the background, generally a studio background, but sometimes in the open air, um, much more so in, in the 1890s. And this was a practice very typical of 19th century photographers, um, and it followed contemporary pictorial conventions. He tended to use neutral backgrounds or painted scenes that suggested forests, mountains, or snowy outdoors. Um, they were also uh, sometimes supplemented with scenes from props, such as balustrades, um, uh, columns, side tables, drapery furnishings, or if he needed a rustic scene, gazebos, tree strump, tree stumps, artificial conifers, and stone piles. Um, these are generally very formal portraits with um, uh, the person slightly to the profile to the camera. Um, they're usually still leaning on something to provide support for uh, taking the image. They are festively dressed and very much kind of in academic like poses drawn probably from painting. Uh, they are generally uh, photograph from head to toe, um, and more rarely from waist up. Uh, and this is so that you can see as much detail as possible of their clothing and accessories. Um, when photographing groups, he sometimes arranged subjects facing forward and others away from the camera to highlight different aspects of costumes. Um, and you'll see kind of uh, stereotypical props used. So for the Hutzels, they'll have smoking pipes, musical instruments, 
axes, pistols, shotguns, powder horns, canes, jugs, uh, even a stuffed hen or rooster, while Jews are portrayed in prayer shawls with books or next to liquor bottles, suggesting an association with inns and saloons. And the Armenians are photographed in three-piece suits near or astride their prized horses. Uh, so this kind of reproduces the ethnographic iconography of contemporary drawings and paintings and does little to convey the people in their context. Now, the museums that hold Dudkevich's photographs, um, and we were chatting about this just before my presentation with Herbert Usnick and Patrice Dabrowski about um, how they're largely anonymous. We don't know who they are. Um, generally, the photographs have labels that are generic, um, such as musicians from Chortkiv, a group of peasants from Berehomet, beekeeper from Chortovet, such as this one here, a gypsy from Kosiu, or an Armenian from Kute. Um, uh, it is only the most prominent people who are characterized by their professions, such as sculptor, coppersmith, or voits, vit, uh, village heads or mayors. So it'd be wonderful to restore identities to some of these people, such as this 100-year-old Ruthine beekeeper who is either from Chortovets or Unij near Horodenka. Um, now, an exception to anonymity was uh, when a judge who was presiding over a trial of Oprishke in Kulumi in 1878 called for Yuliusz Studkevich to come to the courtroom uh, to photograph the 13 convicts, which included the two Drahiruk brothers, Yura and Mikolai. Uh, and Dudkevich also took portraits of some of the individual members uh, of this group of Oprishke, as well as images of the tribunal and of the jurors. The documentation of the trial and the annals of Galician criminology was not unusual by kind of comparable European and American standards, uh, who used photography to disseminate the identities of criminals and to study the physical features of such men. In this particular group uh, portrait of the Drahiruk band, you can observe kind of a nonchalance among them, even though they were facing long incarceration, life imprisonment, or in the case of Yura, death by hanging uh, in the courtyard of the new city hall in Kulumia. Uh, some of them smoke cigarettes, another poses with a pipe uh, while looking kind of defiantly into the camera. Uh, here are some uh, individual portraits of uh, the members of the band who were on trial, as well as um, an aunt of theirs, uh, Anna Heredet-Duke. Um, and then there are some pages of a portrait of Yura and his wife, which I believe was not taken during the trial, but at another time. So for the most part, these individuals or types were not Tutkevich's paying clients. They didn't really have a need for these images. Uh, they were most likely commissions, such as the case of the municipal court in Kulamia. Um, so, and these images would then circulate um, in bookshops. Uh, one could pick them up in the center of Kulamia, in view, Vivano from Kivsk. Um, and they were also sold to ethno ethnographers. Um, and these images also circulated beyond the confines of southeastern Galicia, northern Bukovina. Until the outbreak of First World War, a number of geographical, historical, and ethnographic surveys that treated the lands and peoples of Galicia and Bukovina included illustrations derived from photographs by Dutkevich. Uh, this, for example, is a, a wonderful book that I highly recommend everyone to read, A Girl in the Carpathians by a Scots woman, Manny Mural Dowie. And as you can see, uh, she has included uh, a drawing rendered from a photograph by Dutkevich. Um, everywhere I look, if you do not, if you open any book on the history of uh, the Carpathians, uh, ethnography, um, travel accounts, you're likely to encounter the images even where you don't always expect them. Um, they were also used for ethnographic study um, in serious, more serious publications. 
Um, I'm going to jump ahead here for time. Um, I would like to mention before closing the Dutkevich's participation in the ethnographic exhibit in Kolomia that was organized by the Tatra Society. Um, and the exhibition was administered and financed by the foremost Polish ethnographer, Oskar Kohlberg. Um, and this Tatra Society was akin to other European clubs of the time which had its goals, the exploration and popularization of Carpathian mountains, the fostering of tourism, um, the support and promotion of indigenous folk industry. Um, and uh, there were a number of branches, uh, including one in Stanislavu, one in Kolomia, and one in Viu. Um, and by 1878, the, the, the society had uh, documented and built trails and mapped and uh, set up hunting lodges uh, for tourism. And among the first guests to the Gregorovich Lodge uh, were these esteemed individuals, uh, August Zamoyski and the brothers Vladislav and Leon Sapieha, who Dudkevich photographed uh, during one of their mountaineering hunting expeditions. So the exhibition that was organized in Kolomia had the big draw that Franz Josef was coming to Kolomia, um, as well as his extensive imperial entourage. Um, and it also included the emperor's brother, Archduke Karl Ludwig. Uh, and these visitors came to Kolomia not not only for the Hutzel culture, but also for exhibits organized by the Polish society and uh, also to look at the local Armenian and Roma culture. And aside uh, from photographs, there exhibited uh, all sorts of other types of material culture, linen, textiles, weapons, smoking paraphernalia and the like. And the emperor, um, who was followed closely with Kohlberg, uh, purchased many of the specimens on display and personally admired many of Julius Stutkevich's own photographs, uh, which Julius Stutkevich was able to sell uh, to people such as Franciszek Rechorz, the aspiring Czech ethnographer, who was among his first customers at that time. Uh, Rechorz was on a farm in Volkiv near Lviv, uh, where he was staying with his parents, and he bought a number of photographs to take back to Prague for their ethnographic museum there. And Dudkevich was very impressed by him and sold uh, the photographs at a discount uh, in the name of science. Um, but then he did not receive payment. <laughs> uh, so there, there are the few existing letters I have been uh, able to locate uh, um, suggest that this might have been a common pattern for Dutkevich um, not getting paid. Um, Kohlberg was another um, kind of uh, uh, purchaser of the photographs. And we actually see that they ended up in his work on uh, the ethnography of the region for the volumes on Pukutsia, um, where there are drawings by Tadeusz Rybkowski that were executed based on Dutkevich's original photographs. Um, and Dutkevich and uh, Rybkowski and Kohlberg all knew each other. Here's another example of one of Dudkevich's exhibits, uh, the wealthy peasant's cottage rendered into a drawing in Oscar Kohlberg's work. And um, after the exhibit, um, Dudkevich uh, compiled an album for the emperor and sent it off to him. So some 94 photographs, which are now found at the Austrian National Library uh, were put into the, a beautiful portfolio and into a box that now anyone else can research and they've been digitized for everyone to look and I will share links to some of these uh, images to our audience. Um, and the presentation of the album garnered Dudkevich a gold medal of the Austrian order Literis e Artibus for outstanding service to the arts. Other exhibits and luxurious presentation albums followed throughout the 1880s, 
and Dutkevich received honors from the most esteemed political leaders of Eastern Europe, um, such as the Ro Royal Romanian Medal of Merit, the Royal Serbian Gold Medal, the Bulgarian Order of Merit, and a, a very curious form of gratitude came from Tsar Alexander III in 1885. Um, one of the editors of a Galician regional newspaper reported that Julius Stutkevich, an outstanding citizen of Austria, had offered to the Tsar and to the heir to the throne each a richly bound album containing his views of Kulumia and the Carpathian region. St. Petersburg apparently showed too strong an appetite for this part of the world and rewarded the artist in an unpolitic manner. Alexander thanked him and the heir apparent Nicholas sent Dutkevich a ruby encrusted ring worth 500 golden, about 250 US dollars then or 6,000 presently. So what were Dutkevich's motivations behind these gifts? Was he looking to expand his professional horizons? Um, this was a region that was changing. Uh, nations were awakening beyond the Southwestern Galician Bukovinian frontier following the end of the Russo Turkish War of 1877, 1878. Because of the historical geographical orientation of Pukutia, the region's population maintained close economic and personal ties to Romania, Moldavia, and the Ottoman Empire. So these exhibitions in Moscow, Kolomia, and elsewhere, and the following deliberate photographic gifts established Dutkevich's reputation. He traveled with Carl I of Romania, documenting his itinerary in Bukovina, as we see in this image here with the royal entourage on a bridge over the river Bistvica with the king on horseback uh, in June 1883. And this is the album that the National Library of Romania did not know what it was until I alerted them to, to the fact that they may have um, images by Dutkevich of the king's visit to his estates in this region. And the royal entourage is again assembled along a mountain or rafting down the river, as we see here. Um, Dutkevich, besides accompanying King Karl, he, he also accompanied leading Polish aristocrats in their discovery of Czarnohora. He produced the official photographic survey of the oil wells in Eastern Galicia established by the Polish chemist and entrepreneur Stanislaw Szczepanowski. Dudkevich's views and types found a market among Austrian museum collectors, local Polish landowners, Ruthenian clergy, and a diverse field of ethnographers. He went from being an amateur, perhaps rural photographer, to a recognized master whose craft served at once his commercial needs and those of competing and imperial and national interests. And I will conclude with one of my favorite images and I thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, Ksenia, uh, for this uh, very intense and detailed lecture on the Julius Dudkevich. I learned a lot about this author. And uh, I'm uh, honored and pleased also to uh, give a microphone, though we don't have a microphone here, <laughs> uh, to Patrice Dombrowski. Patrice Dombrowski started this project uh, some time ago, and uh, she is uh, uh, currently an associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and a member of the board of directors of the Polish Institute of Arts and uh, Sciences of America. And uh, uh, Patrice uh, kindly agreed to comment on the lecture of Ksenia, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, first, let me thank Ksenia for a wonderful presentation and congratulate her on her groundbreaking work on this elusive yet important Dutkevich, the photographer. I think you have pursued his biography his activities and his impact across empires in probably in at least five languages. And you've been able to come up with answers that have eluded other uh, scholars. 
So congratulations. I'll say a few words as a historian of the Carpathians and the author of the forthcoming book, The Carpathians Discovering the Highlands of Poland and Ukraine. Ksenia's fascinating project fits in well with what I call the discovery of the Carpathians. Um, when talking about the Eastern Carpathians, the region of Czarnohora, the Hutzel region, one can say that it, the region was essentially discovered around 1880. And this is a year that Ksenia herself mentioned. It was in a year no less important for Dutkiewicz than for the Hutzels and their region. Uh, indeed, earlier, there was relatively little outside knowledge of or familiarity with either the indigenous folk or their homeland. Uh, although we know that in 1878, uh, Dutkevich already starts to make a name for himself by photographing the Drahiruk band. So he's already clued in on to who the Hutzels were when he came into Kaumia. That's very, very obvious. Um, a few years prior to 1880, a branch of the Tatra Society, which was the first Alpine club in Galicia, was established in the large and remote uh, village of Vzhabie, uh, today's Verhovina. And uh, the man behind this, you may be interested to note, was a Ruthenian priest named Sofron Vitvitsky. He was a parish priest in Zhabia. Uh, he's a fascinating individual. Uh, was the first author uh, to write a book on the Hutzels, the Polish language Rys Historyczny o Hutzułach, or a historical sketch on the Hutzels that was published in 1862. So he's really part of this move to popularize the Hutzels. He worked together with the Tatra Society authorities in Krakow to assemble members to form this uh, East Galician branch that was established in 1877. Now, members of the society came not only from the mountain region itself, but from Eastern Galicia more generally and even Bukovina. Um, here I should mention, Ksenia, you may be interested to note that uh, Dutkiewicz was a dues-paying member from 1884 through 1887. So not in 1880 yet, but he does join the, the Czarnohora Ch Ch branch uh, in those years. Now, most members found it difficult to reach Zhabia, which was again, very remote. The, the city of Kolomea uh, quickly became the seat of the branch. Uh, again, known as the Charnohora branch. Um, members took an interest in the mountains, organizing group excursions in the region and building the hiking huts, which we saw a picture of uh, today. Uh, but they also took an interest in the indigenous inhabitants, the Hutzels. Now, the Hutzels were a colorful folk and it's a pity that Dutkiewicz photographed in the age when there was no color photography because that would have been in itself a, a whole explosion of color in his pictures. They had a rich traditional uh, pastoral culture and a very fine sense of artistry reflected in their handicrafts and dress. But at this time around 1880, the Hutzels uh, were impoverished. These are the decades right after emancipation. Now, wanting to drum up interest in Hutzel handicrafts so that the Hutzel could make some money, the Charnohora branch of the Tatra Society organized this ethnographic exhibition for the fall of 1880. Now, this is a relatively small organization organizing an ethnographic exhibition that probably would have been on a very small scale had it not been for the fact that they invited Emperor Franz Josef to attend and he actually accepted their invitation when he was on this tour of, for, uh, of Galicia. So he would be the first and most illustrious guest at the ethnographic exhibition. Uh, 
the Galician provincial authorities got involved and helped to finance the collection of all manner of ethnographic items, these intricately carved wooden items, the guns, pottery, items of clothing uh, and the like. And of course, as we know from today's presentation, they also engaged Dutkiewicz to take photographs for the exhibition and paid him rather nicely, I thought, for those photographs. Well, the items and photos were revelatory the photos that Dutkevich took in the mountains, and recall that this was no small feat, were the first ever photographs of Charnohora. Uh, and here I have a question for Ksenia. As someone intimately familiar with Dutkevich's output, do you know whether he ventured high into the Carpathians prior to the summer of 1880, which he did with one of the members at least one of the members of the uh, Tarnohora branch. If so, I'd be curious what he photographed, if, if there's any way of finding this out. And, and again, surely he could not do this all by himself, as Ksenia has uh, mentioned, you have to have all the equipment, probably horses, uh, who knows, a wagon, something else to carry everything around in the mountain region, which was very challenging at the time. And again, I assume that Dutkevich probably when he was a member of the association of the Tatra Society, also went on trips and probably took further photographs. Um, now, it seems to me, nonetheless, you know, this is re this, uh, uh, regardless of what was said about the, um, the landscape photography, I think that in 1880, even more interest was taken in the ethnographic photographs. The Habsburg Empire was keen on classifying and categorizing the diverse population, and the Galician authorities were no less so. And this was also seen from the later compilation that was called the Kronprinzenwerk, essentially a multi-volume survey of the peoples and places within the empire. Again, it was not the individual subject per se, in ethnographic photographs that counted, as Ksenia mentioned, but rather the type he or she represented. Again, few Hutzels probably paid Dutkevich to have their picture taken. If any, I would guess that it might have been the Zabie village mayor, Ivan Popivchuk, or a village notable like Jurko Skribliak, who was, uh, became famous as a woodcarver. Uh, they might have actually done that, but their average pictures probably were not so. Um, one might also wonder at the authenticity of the photos, which by nature had to be posed, some in Dutkevich's studio, uh, and Ksenia has talked about this, but most of the pictures I saw looked rather authentic, that his Hutzels were wearing really traditional Hutzel dress, not street boots or other sorts of items. Uh, they really were beautiful types uh, prep, uh, represented. Uh, so I guess what I wanted to say in focusing on 1880 is that uh, uh, this, this exhibition not only helped to put the Hutzels on the imperial map, so to speak, but they also put Dutkevich on it as well. Uh, and Dutkevich, of course, parlayed his photo photography into getting an award from the em emperor, which was very clever on his part. And this seemed to be the way he also helped to make a name and reputation for himself. Um, uh, the the Tarnohora branch would continue to popularize the region and its people. But as I mentioned back in my talk in March, the region really gained popularity once the Stanisławów Voronyenka Railway reached the Prut River Valley in 1894. Uh, and there was also a so-called local ban, a local train from Kaolmeya to Delatin that went into operation in 1899. And here I'd just be curious whether Dutkevich availed himself of that uh, connection to take photographs in the Prut River Valley whether in the growing resort of Yaremcha or elsewhere. Uh, 
I think I'm going to skip over some of my comments because Senya also talked about these matters herself. But I just want to end by thinking about also about Dutkevich's identity. As a historian, one needs to emphasize this sort of thing. As usually when thinking about Galicia, we tend to want to categorize individuals by nation or by religion. So with Dutkevich, we have a problem or more likely we have a typical Galician. He was a mutt, a mix of German Ruthenian uh, with a Roman Catholic religion, which is usually identified with Poles. But I assume that none of that troubled him as likely he could function well, perhaps even better than most in this multi-ethnic corner of Galicia. Most important for him, I would warrant, is that which he uh, advertised on the reverse side of his photographs. He was an award-winning photographer for royalty. And with that, I will end. Thank you, Patrice, uh, for these valuable comments. And uh, uh, please, Ksenia, uh, you have time to react. <laughs> well, thank you, Patrice, uh, very much for your, your comments and the historical context. And I am anxiously awaiting the normal functioning of our libraries in North America so that I can see your book and read it. Um, in print, not online. <laughs> um, so I think I will uh, get a lot of um, probably more ideas sparking um, on, on how to contextualize Dutkevich uh, thanks to, to, to your book and, and your comments that you just made. And I, I really am fascinated by this idea that the Tatra society was founded by this Ruthenian priest. I, I think this fits in with some of the discoveries I've been making. So this, um, uh, I think that's a whole nother, you know, um, article or, or book in, in the making, um, uh, or perhaps uh, an outcome of this uh, series of lectures, which I know there will be a conference will be maybe um, some kind of project proposals for future research that may come out of um, our younger historians. Um, I knew that Dutkevich was a member of the society and I actually, there was um, uh, Vasil Kebuzinski who was a practicing uh, physician uh, and head of the general hospital in Peremish where my family is from, who was a member as well. I don't know if he ever actually went on any uh, trips into the Carpathians or just was um, supportive of, of the effort. Um, I, I wonder, you know, for me, I have more of a question than an answer for what you suggested about how the society was to improve um, the Hutzel's economic situation after emancipation by bringing money to them, how much money actually, you know, went to them or, or to the, the organizing efforts uh, of, of in specific individuals. As far as your question about, did Dutkevich photograph in the Carpathians, high up in the Carpathians prior to 1880? I, I have a, a hunch that yes, he did. I think it dates from his time in Suchava. I think this is a period of time that is, I have yet to kind of surface um, the leads that I need, but looking at images of his, um, you know, his whole corpus uh, from the beginnings in the 1860s through to the 1890s, there are ones that uh, were printed for the, Dudkevich actually presented Franz Josef two photo albums, one in 1880 after, or 1881 after the, exhibition in Kulumi, and then again for the Jubilee celebration in, in the 18, was it 99? Um, and looking at them, there are photographs of, in Bukovena of monasteries high up in the mountains. And I, I think that these date from an earlier period, but I you know their first appearance where I can actually identify date is with that album in the Austrian National Library. I, I have no other 
clues I can go by, but I have a hunch that he was working much more expansively in that area besides just doing portraits um, in a studio. Um, so I, I think yes uh, is the answer, um, but it requires some further research and perhaps uh, Herbert Usnick might have some ideas. You're right. I mean, the, the portraits are definitely what um, he is known by and is how his um, work has come to be known um, in, in the various book projects, uh, the big book projects that came out of uh, the Austrian Empire, as well as um, uh, amongst uh, other, you know, Germany and, and Russia as well. Um, but I, I feel this causes us to overlook the quality of his landscapes. And I really would um, think his landscapes are sp superb um, because of the vantage points, as well as his townscapes. And I think there's a lot more to surface. We know he took a whole series of photographs uh, in Stanislavu in the 1870s. Um, I found documentation in a newspaper article. There, there's a whole series, but I have yet, I, I need to physically go um, because again, uh, if, if the images are not cataloged by a photographer or if it's just <laughs> sitting in a library somewhere as views of Stanislavu or Ivano, but I, you have to actually physically go. I also think there's a lot more to uncover um, in Chernivtsi. Um, he did, was also, he, he was very good at um, photographs of, um, Townscape. So he did a whole series in Chetnitsi. He did ones of train stations, uh, monumental train stations as the railway came about. And I, I think you're right to point to the railway as, as expanding his horizons um, and mobility. He was, in, I mean, you think he was born in Pest uh, um, and, and all the ground that he covered and um, uh, it, it, it's a, a fascinating journey. Um, so I think I will stop there and, 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 and look forward to the next comments. Uh, thank you, Xenio. And uh, we are very happy uh, to have a second uh, discutant uh, from the city of Vienna, which some time ago used to be also the capital for Ilyush Dudkevich, and uh, Herbert Jusnik from the Volkskunde Museum. Uh, who knows very well the ethnographic and not only ethnographic collection of images, photographs, which were taken by various agents and that are collected in Vienna. And uh, we hope that Herbert will shed more light on these imperial practices on the peripheries of uh, Austria. Uh, so please, Herbert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bogdan, and uh, thank you to the Lviv Center and Patrice Dabrowski uh, for inviting me over. Um, it's kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tending to be a little bit shy because um, my, my approach is far more theoretical, so that kind of huge historical depth that you both uh, provide is, is not, makes me shy. And Xenia, thank you very, very much because uh, actually I've been working on the images of uh, Tutkiewicz, but I didn't know who was behind those images. So it was kind, it's kind of an enlightening moment for me to, to uh, have heard your presentation. Um, but I will go in a little bit another direction. Um, it's, um, I should, can I share my screen? Yes, okay. Um, um, what I want to talk about is um, um, is about actually I'm going to you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, actually, I'm going to to do a far more boring talk because I'm going to show images over and over again uh, because I did a show on uh, folk types uh, with the uh, idea in mind to look at them in a kind of post-colonial focus um, uh, of how those types were produced as an other. Uh, and um, with the images of uh, Dudkiewicz, 
it's kind of not easy, but very obvious uh, how those um, images of the others were produced. On the one hand, uh, it's uh, something that works by repetition. And on the other hand, it's something that works what uh, Johannes Fabian has called othering. I think everybody knows a little bit about that. It is producing the anthropological subject uh, by going into distance. And that kind of going into distance follows as a certain mechanics that is similar to uh, the production of uh, fog types. I've just recently looked very closely at uh, this image. Sorry, I have to change here. Um, yeah, here we are. It's uh, from Raimund Friedrich Keindl. Um, Written in 1894, it's uh, for the German-speaking um, Volkskunde that was just in the process of institutionalization. The museum in Vienna was formed in those days and all, all the other uh, museums of Volkskunde uh, were formed uh, all over Europe. And uh, so it's the first uh, ethnographic monography that was write, written for Volkskunde. And um, in this book, Kindl, as do other ethnographers working on certain populations works uh, in with that those methods of othering and those methods of othering and this typification that works there is insofar interesting it's not only uh, interesting for what's going on in ethnography in uh, Volkskunde in the museums and in those publications that are widespread but it's also interesting politically because those uh, indigenous types or the primitivized and the indig uh, and sorry, I don't know if there's something like indigenization, those indigenized people are used in the political discussions uh, all over Galicia, but also in other uh, regions. On the one hand, they are uh, an argument for industrialization because we have so backward people, we have to set up civilizing missions. And on the other hand, it's uh, arguments, these are our peoples, we have, uh, a kind of Anspruch. Um, um, we want to have a grasp on those regions because we are the original inhabitants. And uh, what is happening in um, those, uh, in or how the, pro the process is working in a certain way, it's uh, three main uh, methods that are taking place. The one is that those types and also the population that is imagined, and for example, um, Kindle's book, The Hutsuls, it's not, uh, as, we, as, as you've been already talking about the types, it's not about a, a single person, an individual, it's about a type. And so The Hutsuls, even if he says, okay, I'm speaking about them, them, and them, and then he takes uh, a certain part of information from here, from there, it's always an entity. So one thing what happens in this typification is a homogenization of those uh, people. The other one is a delocalization. So mostly there is no information where he has the information from. And it's uh, um, what Johannes Fabian calls coevalness. So it's uh, distanced from time. You don't know when, when that happens. It's always kind of a, a shining uh, thousand year old entity of a population that has an imaginary horizon that is produced by leaving out those contexts, leaving out those details. Um, and um, that is what happening in, is what's happening in the books. And uh, why I took uh, Kindle is for those images uh, we have here. Um, is, Herbert, um, yeah. we can't see the image. No. Uh, okay, why? Okay, sorry, then I have We to can work. see your slide with the title, but it's oh, not okay. the Kindle image. Good, wait a moment, um, I'm going to... Sorry to interrupt. No, no, please, please, this is an important interruption. Um, okay. So. Um. Okay, can you see it now? No, yes, 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 yes. 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 It works, but it's the wrong ones. I'm sorry, because I have them in different folders here. Okay. Um, sorry for that. 
Okay, do you have it now? Yes. Okay, this is one of the examples from, um, from um, Kendall's book. And uh, the, they are, um, well, most of the images that Kindle uh, uses, not only in this one book, but in most of his publications, when he's uh, talking about Hutsuls or Ruthenians, he, he, depending on the, on the political circumstances, he changes from Hutsuls to, to Ruthenians. Uh, they are mostly from, uh, from Tutkiewicz. What he does here uh, is that he uh, cuts away all the context or surroundings. And so we have uh, an image uh, where he has a little description on it, but it's uh, in abstraction, a group of Hutsuls. Um, and uh, so we don't have a certain uh, an exact moment of time when it was photographed. We have only a group of people. It's not specified who they, they are exactly. And um, yeah, that's so the, the decontextualization that takes away time, that takes a very uh, abstract uh, exact place works in all those images. So it's uh, it's not only when Kindle uses them, but, but those images were produced as a uh, carte de cabinet. And as far as we know, uh, a photographer had to produce at about 300 uh, carte de cabinet uh, to uh, have a, a revenue from the production of one photograph. This means there were 300 of those photographs circulating without any contextual information. Kindle of gives a little bit of contextual information. In our inventory books, we have a little contextual information, but as Xenia, you told, we need and never have uh, precise names. We have somehow a hundred year old man, like that's a one of our very precise information that we get. So those images are circulating without um, having um, those precise informations and they're th circulating in thousands. Um, I just have to switch now to another image. Sorry, I thought that uh, that would work easily with, um, with, uh, um, Zoom. But I was mistaken, so I'm sorry for having to so slowly switch from one image to the other. Um, okay. It, it's, it's worth the wait. Okay, thank you for that. It's a little bit embarrassing because I had uh, had a try out of that and it looked so fine to be flexible with those images. But Zoom has another thought on that. Um, so this is what I'm what I'm going to present now is um, a uh, is images from a newspaper or a popular magazine called Globus um, that started already in the mid 19th century. It was uh, one of the foundations of Karl Andre. And uh, in there, um, Kindle gives uh, an account of, um, uh, of a wedding uh, in a Hutsul, um, in a Hutsul region, sorry. Why am I so slow with that? In a true reach, uh, in 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 uh, Permet and Brut. Interestingly, he doesn't give it with uh, his own um, records, but with the records of Grigory Kupchanko, that Russophile a uh, researcher and activist that had done very very early uh, ethnographic research on Hutsuls, and um, what we can see here on the one hand, the text is kind of. If you read the text by, by Kindle, it's like you, you read some fairy tale. It's not, there was an interview. Uh, Grigory Kupchanko spoke with the people. He had made records of those, uh, those talks. So it was a dialogue, dialogical process. But in that text, all that is kind of presence is if it's, it, uh, all that is concreteness disappears to that kind of fairy tale style that it, that, uh, uh, 
uh, resides an account of something very distanced. And um, as you see, the photographs here are again used uh, without any um, uh, surroundings, means, means they are kind of photoshopped. I will then show you the, 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 the original the printing, um, printing images that were used for that. And um, that's, so sorry, I lost my track. Um, anyway, I'm gonna show you those because that's what was what I wanted to do is uh, to show those production processes that are running behind those uh, circulating images. Um, what you see here is uh, the um, the original that was used for the the news uh, for the for the illustrated magazine where you see it's kind of photoshopped uh, the white surrounding here means it is cut it off and so placed in that uh, distanced uh, and delocalized space uh, we can see that with the second one here and also the third one here and it is as you see uh, on the on the uh, carton it is to give it that is always used in those images uh, by um, uh kindle and others um i think i've been talking for a long time now i have two two short more examples that i no i'm gonna skip that here uh what i would show what i've shown is that um kind of chew on a, on a on horseback that you already showed xenia i have it in different versions and the interesting thing is that it has been taken in the 1880s something like that and I can trace those versions until 1922 in a um, highly uh, in, um, um, in a Völkerkunde by Georg Buschan with thousands, hundreds of images where he used, still uses the same image uh, that was made 40 years ago without any date, without any uh, announcement of uh, the precise uh, location and things like that, just the abstract thing and abstract type. And the other thing is that we have a huge publication called Mein Österreich, a kind of a coffee table book, a huge coffee table book, a condensed Kronprinzenwerk. And um, there you have dozens, not dozens, it's nearly a dozen of images of uh, kind of, of Tutkiewicz that come where we have, it's seven, seven images. And of all those seven images, we have two to four uh, originals uh, or prints by Tutkiewicz in our collection coming from different uh, contexts. So in the German speaking uh, ethnographic sciences, Tutkiewicz was one of the most popular images and he kind of, you have the impression that he designed uh, the, the appearance of the myth, myth Galicia in for the German speaking imperial um, networks uh, circulating around Vienna. So that's for now. Thank you, Herbert, for this contextualization. You can uh, yeah, switch off the, <laughs> the image. And uh, it's, uh, I, I found it very interesting that, uh, that Kevich was also placing people in a kind of this abstract background in the mountains. Uh, and then it was again cut off in Vienna for the other purposes. And this, this mediatization uh, of uh, this imagination is exciting. And I find it interesting for kind of for the uh, thinking of the time, but please Xenia, uh, your reflection. Um, I'm, I'm well aware of the richness of um, approaches to interpret the images as we find them now. Um, so uh, uh, whether they're in the presentation albums or, or um, in private collections or appearing in uh, journals or books of the time or now appearing in, you know, for example, Larry Wolf's book on Galicia or who knows where else um, in posters. And I, I mean, it's such a richness of topic. Um, and, and I think my role is to leave all that still um, for, for pursuit, um, academic pursuit, but to, in my research, to 
provide greater detail and contextualization and localization for new interpretations um, that are historically grounded. So, so not to do away with um, the play that we can have with his images and how they are re endlessly reproduced and cut out and reconfigured and um, cropped in, in, in ways. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's maybe even should serve a cautionary note um, to, to publishers who like attractive books to have illustrations when we don't even think about reflexively what we include. It's just there um, a, a, as an example to supplement the text without the analysis that Herbert, you bring to, to the images. I think that's essential. So I, my very kind of micro uh, approach is is again so that you know a historian of the local history of just one of these places that he photographed or the population or the relatives maybe th th there are new kinds of histories that could be told that we don't know how did you know how did they come to get photographed. Uh, maybe there's oral oral history memory that's been passed down from Jen. Oh, you know, my, <laughs> that, uh, you know, person or individual in the photograph, uh, with, you know, that we see everywhere, that's my relative. <laughs> so, so that's my approach, but I, you know, it would be wonderful to, to kind of also write something completely in another venue or avenue of looking at stepping away from the picture and just looking at the proliferation so I definitely appreciate and look forward to um, I know you're organizing your Herbert you and your museum another exhibition that will feature Dudkevich so I I look forward and I think um it was um, typical um, in the way that uh, Dudkevich was a photographer of the Austrian Empire, the Vienna, it has been the most interest coming from Vienna, although Poland is also um, beginning to do some uh, interesting, uh, Polish scholars are doing interesting research on Dudkevich. Um, and there have been some recent exhibitions. Um, it's the Ukrainian side has lagged behind. And th that's the problem with this kind of nationalization of, of history um, where the Austrian component has can always kind of fall back on this uh, multicultural imperial project to, to ground these kinds of things. Um, I had, I, I, may, I might have misunderstood. I wanted, because I'm not a historian of photography, you mentioned uh, three, that it took 300 cartes de visite to produce one photograph. And I, was it the sale of, or, or um, yeah, I, I missed something there. No, no, it's, it's the other way around uh, from, um, so that, that it, um, when we have um, um, a cardboard with his uh, name and all those uh, title um, or those, those medals and all those uh, uh, tellings of the photographer and uh, the image uh, glued to it, uh, this means that uh, he has at least produced 300 of them because only when he produces 300 of them, it's worth producing, uh, not doing the photograph, but producing the edition. And uh, so we have, uh, of those photographs, we have, uh, uh, and it's just for, because my, my approach is coming from the kind of reception of images and the circulation of images and the question of uh, what they mean in science. Uh, and so I wanted to know, we have, we know a lot of uh, places where those photographs appear. I would love to, to, to know how many images by Tutkiewicz you have found in all the different copies. It must be an enormous list. Uh, but I wanted to figure out uh, how the figure, the number of images is that we can think about. And so if you go uh, and say, okay, if I get one copy with this name printed on, means, okay, there are 300 more of them. Then in the museum, we have those photographs five times in five different editions, which means, okay, it's now 1,500. 
Then we have uh, of that uh, Volker from 1922 that I was talking about, it has uh, an addition number of either 15 or 25,000. Those were kept in libraries where not only one person, but kind of dozens of persons saw those images and on and on and on. So uh, when we have that, that kind of, I don't know how many images it was that he produced 700 or something like that. And in copies and copies and copies, it's kind of, you can do that for any photographer, but it says, okay, those photographs, they really shaped, one photographer with his images shaped the image of a region. So it's extremely important. And this says, okay, we have the image of the Hutsuls mostly, or of the further region of uh, uh, their, their inhabitancy is uh, framed through a single lens. There is others that have photographed them, but he's so prominent uh, that uh, you have, you always have that to have that in mind that the image of them is the image of one lens. <clears throat> That was brilliant. Thank you so much for that clarification. Uh, it's a very, very helpful and to, to consider, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm still trying to get that, that uh, so, because now if you want, I could finally give you a, a, a quick run through um, one of his imaginaries in uh, a book that's really in a kind of, uh, it shows a lot if you see those images and not only hear me talking about them. So if I might, I would love to, to, to once share my screen again with you. May I? Okay. okay. So uh, here we go. So do you see it? This is a publication called Mein Österreich, Mein Heimatland. It's published 19, 1914. And it has uh, the title pages are full of all the, um, the Stadthalter, the governors of the, the crown countries. Um, and um, uh, so it's, it was really a huge propagandistic endeavor to uh, produce that volume. And in that you have um, all those images by Dudkiewicz. Um, Tine, I think you will know them very well, um, that are um, published and shaped for, uh, for, the, um, for the publication. We have it here in a vignette. Here we have it cut a little bit. Here we have it completely photoshopped and freigestellt, like, like it sounds in German. Here we have it as a whole image. And then it goes on with those images we have in uh, our collections. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's really embarrassing. Somehow this, all the, the, what I prepared in images doesn't work. Um, you remember that image we had before uh, in, um, in Xenia's presentation. It's the interesting thing is that in our collections, we have those images repeated and repeated and repeated again and again. And that's something that should show up, but somehow the techniques that don't work, it's, I'm deeply sorry for that. Uh, I, I propose that we can have also uh, the, the, the possibility to others also to ask questions if there are. Yes, um, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have a kind of a question from YouTube uh, uh, from, uh, the, I suppose, Polish, uh, your Leszek Remarowicz. Herbert is showing us images. Please ask, I'm just <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, And the, the, the question uh, was, uh, were there any articles written about Dutkiewicz in Ukraine? Uh, but uh, uh, mainly Dutkiewicz is used in the same manner as uh, uh, highlighted here. So as, as a kind of supplemented uh, images for various ethnographic or regional studies or regional, so we call this Kreisnaustvo, or the regional studies or regional historic studies. We don't have any critical uh, analysis or critical reviews, but then also Andrzej Vieloha 
replied by sending his article in the uh, magazine uh, Almanach Karpatsky. And I agree with Ksenia that uh, Dudgevich is much, much more known in uh, Poland and Austria than in Ukraine. Indeed, it's a pity. But uh, we can shape it in a bigger question uh, about the bibliography, <laughs> you know. Uh, and maybe Ksenia can comment on this, or Pantries, uh, or, or Herbert also. Uh, uh, who writes about this and from which perspective? So we, we understand that there is a history of uh, images what this perspective that Herbert shows us, you know, the background images and the interactions of images. And then there are other possibilities like the social history, also the national history. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I would say there, there has been in, in Ukrainian, um, no, nothing um, that's been written in a substantial way. Um, the, um, uh, if we're talking about present work um, and not um, like Kupchanko uh, that Herbert mentioned, um, you know, uh, of, of, and he wasn't discussed, it was just his images, right? So as a photographer, you don't, there was no research about the practice uh, of photography or how images were disseminated or how studios were run. And I think there's questions that we can think about. I know there was a recent book out of Poland about women's roles in these studios. So the wives would often be responsible for running the studio. Um, so, you know, what does Juliusz Stutkiewicz's name actually mean when it's signed on those uh, prints or imprinted on the versos? Um, we know he had a son who, who also worked in the studio. Um, so it, it could be kind of like, you know, Renaissance painting where you had a school of, um, and, and there were man, many individuals associated with that studio. But th this, I think I was trying to point to in, in the beginning of my presentation is just the general lack of context for professional class. Um, in writing of history, um, because you know it's the mer what about the merchants, the people, the the bookstore owners? Um, I, although there has been more research done on that and published, there's been some very good work on on the role of bookstores in Lviv, in particular, um, who were you know primarily responsible for um, putting these photographs in the windows and, and that's how people would buy them, but the whole distribution network. So um, it is hoped that with Kirillo Horishni that we will be filling in um, some, something that's missing. Um, uh, we still have not completely shaped the project. Um, as I said, it's a work in progress, but um, and we're hoping it will be, initially we thought trilingual, um, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, English, but, you know, maybe it should be, I, you know, German as well, though. Um, so, uh, so that's the answer to the, that particular question. And I think I, you, there was a second question wrapped in there. So if you can re refresh my memory. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's more about like, uh, who is writing and from which perspectives uh, about the subject? Well, uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> there has been this recent book, um, Eva Manikovska on photography and cultural heritage in the age of nationalisms. Um, it came out very recently um, uh, in 2019, I think late in 2019. Uh, and um, it includes uh, a chapter on uh, Dudkevich and in, in, I mean, not directly about him, but there's a lengthy section there, but um, it's much more of an analysis of the role of ethnography and of ethnographic exhibitions and less on the photographer. Um, and um, so, which, which is fine, but uh, so, so it's, this is a new area, but I also think another, you know, along the lines of Patrice's approach of, um, you know, you, discovery of the Carpathians, uh, the you know, on the 
eastern side um uh, and maybe it, when we're thinking by photography it shouldn't just be one photographer there there were many who followed Dutkevich and there were some who were his contemporaries in the 1890s who photographed Yeremche and created photo albums so um that history still needs to be written uh, and so this is just one little part and I, I believe the next um lecture in this series will be on painting and I I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing <laughs> whether I see Dutkevich in these paintings <laughs> um, so I I think it'll be a, a real nice kind of compliment which is I believe it's next week um Yes, yes, I, I, I can advertise this event. Uh, in a week, we will have a lecture by Agnieszka jankowska Majec from Kraków, and she made her PhD on studying uh, uh, Lviv-based artists like Pauj, Sikulski, and others uh, who called themselves Hutzels. And this group of Polish artists living in urban Lviv uh, were so 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 struck by this uh, ethnographic imagination that they would consider themselves also who like being almost uh, emerged in this uh, uh, beautiful surroundings and we we, we see how this uh, I, I think these uh, images of Dudkevich and the spread the massive spread of these images they also struck the imagination of art and many people in urban placements. Uh, my, my question, if I may, is about the, uh, the binding of these books. Uh, was this related to the, his family business? Because we know the, the, from the history of photography that uh, the ways photographers could share their works was through books, bindings, exhibitions, uh, and various other activities. But apparently he used all the possibilities, like, you know, he would bind the uh, images into books, he would uh, participate in exhibitions. Can you highlight a bit uh, on this? Sure, um, I, I mentioned um, uh, in passing that, um, you know, in terms of his parents, um, his father uh, was uh, uh, in the Austrian army. He was a canonist um, and um, after his service, he, he settled back in his uh, in Nadvirna, um, and he uh, then moved on to Ivano Frankivsk, where he participated in the defense <laughs> of <laughs> Ivano Frankivsk uh, during the Polish uprising um, of 1848-49. Um, but um, I have found references to him as being a, a bookbinder. And so uh, we find when Dutkevich uh, is, well, so Dutkevich, his father gets honored for his kind of uh, service to the Austrian empire by getting a, a, a position in Chernivtsi um, at the, the provincial the, um, seat there. Uh, but we find some notice uh, that he was a bookbinder and that Dutkevich, Julius, when he was in Suchava, I found in the sacramental records of birth um, for, for children that died in infancy, listing his occupation as bookbinder, not as photographer. So he um, clearly learned the practice. It w went hand in hand with photography. Um, he, I have no doubt that the album that we have here in University of Toronto and the leather binding was in his hand. Um, and we have reference for the one in the, the first one in the Austrian National Library from 1880 that he designed that box because it's described in great detail in an article in the newspaper and I when I went to see it it matched exactly the description um, and he created other presentation albums uh, for various uh, local events in Kulumia which I have yet to track down I'm sure that they may be in hands of private collectors uh, so uh, yeah, um, and it's interesting that Yulia Stutkevich's first wife, uh, who he married in Chernivtsi, 
uh, was a marchande de mode. Uh, so she um, worked with fashion retail. Um, so I wonder if there was also some connection on that side um, in terms of uh, the, the clothes that you needed to run a studio, a portrait studio, you know, the hats and the gloves and all that, so that there may have been um, some role that she played. She was much older than him. Um, but uh, so, yeah, um, I have, I see that the album that Dudkevich presented to Franz Josef the second time um, has been digitized, but there's no, um, there's no traces of the binding that I, so I, I will need to inquire because uh, they photographed the binding of the first one, but not of the second one. So I'm not sure if, if it is lost or not. Um, but it was very typical to place carte de visite in these kinds of albums. Um, so even private citizens who would have been collecting these images may have very well um, had commissioned him to place them in a binding. Yes. Uh, if uh, there are uh, any questions in this audience, it's the uh, right time to... Yeah. Please, Herbert. Herbert, you need to unmute uh, your mic. Sorry. Uh, Bogdan, when you, when you said uh, before that it was for you a surprise that... Um, they were so cut out all right in the mountains and now uh, they are cut it out even more uh, in those photographs that's kind of some, something where, where you, that uh, should be more inquiry on that question because for ethnography one of the most important methodologies is uh, isolating the object to produce the object and that's kind of uh, something that runs very closely to the use of photography and that isolating or that construction of a field is something that you can trace over more than one science. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just, I think it's a very important point to think about. I also find it uh, uh, fascinating that actually these images were placed in this, this uh, almost fairy tale, as you mentioned, uh, uh, say abstract you way yes abstraction so uh, then we have uh, these uh, images of real people uh, in a way designed as if it were uh, these archaic you know shepherds really and and they had the power to uh, to to invoke in people in urban set settings uh, these imaginations and they had the powerful i can imagine that they had a powerful impact on and it's, being... it's actually when I when I, uh, some time ago I was talking to a, to a friend of mine who is Viennese born and lived all her lifetime in Vienna and I'm coming from a countryside and then she started to talk about the countryside and I in a, within a second I felt like being a Hutzul in a certain way I felt like being some fairy tale person in the way she was talking about me or not me but about about the countryside it was like stereotype banalized uh, image of how people live in a countryside that they live differently from people in the city which who have you got out of different bodies yeah theoretically yes but that's it, it still lasts up to today the the creation of the typification is something that has its impact still today and i also think it has an impact on the small man that that kind of invention of uh journals and politics when they talk about people the small man it's also it's the same way of uh, primitivizing and what you said abstract it's an abstract generalization that cuts out any individual traits in a certain way and makes them work as political uh, instruments it's interesting we had a visiting uh, group of uh, scholars from ireland from dublin and uh, they wanted to see mountains and they associated colomea with the mountains and whatever they talked that we are going to colomea to see the mountains and we we kind of replied there are no mountains in colomea <laughs> and uh, in popul popular imagination these images also shape this idea that these small towns like you know snyaten colomea or sambir or whatever 
Uh, they're almost somewhere atop in the mountains, but these were mainly inhabited by these multiple, various, uh, transnational, whatever, <laughs> population of various people and groups, and they were near the mountains. And, and we're still lacking in Ukraine, for instance, this critical approach. There, there is no kind of this reading, uh, colonial reading of this imagery. Uh, okay, we have almost two hours uh, of this beautiful event, and uh, I think it's a good time to to end. Uh, uh, I am very thankful uh, to Ksenia Kibuzinski for this beautiful lecture, and uh, I learned a lot, and I hope we all learned uh, a lot from this lecture. I am very thankful to Patrice and to Herbert for uh, commenting and giving these valuable details and uh, additional information to this lecture and uh, I'm very thankful to all of other people who we don't see on the other side uh, of YouTube channel watching this uh, lecture online in various places uh, of this small world and uh, please come uh, over next week uh, to, to, to also to listen to interesting lecture by the Polish scholar Agnieszka uh, Marzet and uh, uh, what else? I, I, I wish the great day to all of you who are on the other side of the planet. And uh, here we have the end of the day. <laughs> so I wish you a pleasant evening and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Bogdan. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. So much. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Herbert. Thank, Thank you, Patrice. Bogdan. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.